Well, we can't say it about all the songs that we sing here at Lakeside, but that song is a song that not we will be singing in heaven, they are already singing in heaven. Revelation chapter 5, the text on which that song is based, reads like this, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests, to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels round the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well in light of the fact that we have two short term missions teams heading out this week, I thought it would be good for us to consider together today the why of it all. What is the, the main motivation for missions? What should motivate us to pray and to give and to send people so that others can hear the good news of what, what God has done for us through his son, Jesus, to rescue us from sin, death, and hell? What should compel us to faithfully and boldly proclaim the gospel to everyone, everywhere? What should inspire us to sacrifice a huge amount of time and energy and money to bring the message of salvation to the remotest parts of the earth? to the tiniest, farthest little island there in the Fijian Islands. Well, I think the song that we just sang provides us the answer to these questions. It's very simple. Christ is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. And furthermore, Christ is worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. Which is all the praise of all the people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that he purchased with his own blood on the cross. Some of you may know the story of the first two Moravian missionaries, David Nietzscheman and Johann Dobert, who in 1732 heard about the plight of 3,000 African slaves on an island in the Caribbean that we know today as St. Thomas. And they had an atheistic owner who was determined to never let any preacher or missionary come to that island. So these slaves 
were destined to live and die without ever hearing about Jesus Christ. And so the two men determined to do something about it. And so they sold themselves as slaves to that wicked slave owner. And they used the money to pay for their passage to the island in order to work among the slaves and be able to share the gospel with them. And many questioned the wisdom of their decision. Others begged them not to go. But as their ship left the dock, they linked arms with one another, and one of them raised his hand and shouted to the crowd that had gathered to send them off. He said, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And that became the clarion call of the Moravians' missionary movement. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Well, in order to dig down deeper into this question, it's a profound question, by the way, what is the main motive for missions? I think we need to answer two other questions. First, um, what is the message of missions? That's a question we need to answer. Well, what is the message of missions? What is it that we're supposed to tell people? Well, turn to the book of Psalms with me, Psalm 96, and we're not going to do an exposition of one text this morning, we're just going to do a a quick little Bible study, if you will, of of this whole idea of the the main motive for missions, but look look with me at Psalm 96, Psalm 96, and the title in my Bible says, A Call to Worship the Lord, the Righteous Judge, and we're immediately called to sing to the Lord. Three times we're exhorted to sing to the Lord and to proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. What are we to proclaim? What are those good tidings of his salvation? Well, verse 3 tells us, tell of his what? Glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. So what is the message of missions? What are we to tell people? We are to tell them about the glory and the greatness of God. In other words, we need to let them know about all, that, all of God's wonderful attributes and all of God's wonderful deeds, all that he is and all that he does, everything that makes him great and glorious. So that's the message of missions. How about the, the goal of missions? What, what is the goal of missions? Well, why are we supposed to tell people about his glory? Turn to Psalm 67, just back a couple pages there to the left, Psalm 67. The title in my Bible says, The Nations Exhorted to Praise God. And the psalmist here tells why God chooses to bless people. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way, be, may, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. What's the goal? Verse three, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. I don't know about you, but I feel very blessed. I would assume you feel blessed too. Just the fact that we live here in America. And have you ever wondered why God blessed America? Was it so we could sit back and enjoy, you know, a comfortable lifestyle and a nice home and a nice car and nice vacations? And is that why he blessed the United States of America? Well, whether you realize it or not, for the last several centuries, God has used the United States of America to fund world missions. 
And I think he blessed us and, and made us the most prosperous nation in the history of the world for his kingdom's sake. And that's the mindset that, that we should have, that, that God has blessed us. He's been gracious to us. He's caused his face to shine upon us. Why? So that, the, that his way would be known on the earth, that the entire earth would praise him and give him glory. So the goal of missions, in the words of John Piper, are, is the gladness of the nations in the greatness of God. The gladness of the nations in the greatness of God. In other words, when people see and understand God for who he really is, they will naturally praise him and honor him and worship him and give him what is due him, which is glory. They recently came out with the 30th anniversary edition of one of my all-time favorite books, probably my favorite book on missions that I've ever read. It's called Let the Nations Be Glad, The Supremacy of God in Missions by John Piper. How many of you have read this book? Okay. There needs to be way more hands raised. Okay. This is a game changer right here. Uh, it will revolutionize your thinking about world missions and, and your role in it. Um, we, we got some copies in the Resource Center um, for sale. I encourage you to consider running out of here this morning. Not yet. You might, after I read this quote from it, you'll say, i got to get there and make sure I don't miss out. But this is what John Piper said. Probably the fo most famous line from this book is simply this. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Missions exist because worship doesn't doesn't. He says, the goal of missions is to bring the nations into the white hot worship of God. And he says that all of history is, is moving toward this great end, the, the white hot worship of God. And missions is simply a means to that great end. It's a temporary necessity for an eternal reality, and that is the worship of God. That people from every tribe, tongue, and nation would worship the Lamb around his throne. So, if we know the message of missions and the goal of missions, we can now return to the question of the motive for missions. Let me give you a little multiple choice question here, class. What is the greatest motivation for missions? You ready? You got three options. Number one, being committed to the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verse 19, go into all the world and make disciples, right, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a, a pretty good motivation for missions. We're commanded by Christ to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's number one. Number two, being concerned about the lost. Being, being concerned about the lost. And, and Jesus was concerned about the lost. Matthew 9, verse 36, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So, greatest motiva motivation for missions, being concerned about the loss. There's this great harvest that, that needs to be reaped, and we need people to get out there and to pick the fruit, if you will. Or number three, being consumed with the glory of God. Being consumed with the glory of God. So, there you go. Multiple choice. What is the greatest motivation for missions? Number one, being committed to the Great Commission. Number two, being concerned about the lost. Number three, being consumed with the glory of God. Lock in your answers. It makes sense to me that if the message of missions is the glory of God and the goal of missions is the glory of God, then the motive of missions is also the glory of God. And yet, Many preachers and, and missionaries and mission organizations try to motivate people primarily using A and B or one and two 
right? The Great Commission, the, the compassion for the lost. You know, we, we need to be obedient to God's command. We need to have a, a burden for, for, for the lost people, lost souls all around the world. We even try to motivate ourselves with these two things. And, and listen, those are good motives. They're right motives. Missions and evangelism is an obedience issue. It's also a burden for the lost issue. It's a, it's a faithfulness issue, but more than anything else, it is a worship issue. The best and highest and greatest motivation for missions is being consumed by the reality that God is worthy to be praised and glorified. And it stands to reason if the goal of missions is the gladness of the nations in the greatness of God, then it stands to reason that we ourselves must be glad in the greatness of God. Psalm 9, verse 1, David says this, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Psalm 70, verse 4. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Let me put it this way. I don't know what was going on in your heart when we were singing that last song, Is He Worthy? That's between you and the Lord. But if you weren't moved by the lyrics of that song, thinking about what we're actually saying and doing, and that it wasn't compelling to you, like, wow, this is amazing, I'm, that, that Christ is the only one who's worthy of honor and glory and, and praise. Listen, if it doesn't matter to you, then you're not going to care if anyone else thinks he's worthy. If he's not worthy to you, first and foremost. We can't commend to others what we don't cherish ourselves. Mission starts with a, a, a personal passion for God and his glory. And if we're not passionate about knowing God and worshiping God and pleasing God, then we won't care if other people know him or worship him or please him. Having a, a passion, a, a burden for the lost is very important, but it's not as important as having a passion and, and burden for God's glory. Piper quotes in Let the Nations Be Glad, Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray said this, as we seek to find out why with such millions of Christians, the real army of God that is fighting the host of darkness is so small. In other words, we're trying to figure, I'm scratching my head. We got millions of Christians all over the world, and yet those who are actually fighting the battle, it's just a small group of people. Why is that? He said the, the only answer is, a lack of heart. The enthusiasm of the kingdom is missing, and that is because there is so little enthusiasm for the king. And I think the reason why some Christians and, and churches have no desire to be involved in missions and evangelism is because they lack enthusiasm for the king and his kingdom. They don't have a heart for God. And what's more, they don't have God's heart. You say, well, what is God's heart? Well, you might not like the sound of this at first. It might rub you the wrong way. But the primary passion of God's heart is to be glorified by everyone and everything he created. be like, I don't know if I like the sound of that. Because we're not supposed to seek glory. You're right, because you're not God. And I'm not God. And so it's a sinful thing for us to 
to seek to be glorified. But God is God. The only uncreated thing in the universe who created everything else and everyone else. And so guess what? He has every right to be glorified. Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory. God created you. He created me. He created all of us for one purpose, to bring him glory, to glorify him. And he is supremely committed to displaying and upholding his glory. Isaiah 48, 11 says this, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. You're like, wait a minute, this kind of sounds like it's all about him. You're right, it is. And that's okay. Because he's God. He says, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? God does, in other words, God doesn't want anybody else to get any glory but him alone. You're like, well, that sounds prideful. That sounds so, no, listen, this is God we're talking about. It'd be wrong for you, it'd be wrong for me to say that. For my own sake, I'm gonna do whatever I do. It's, for, it's all about me. I'm not sharing glory with anyone else. I want all the glory to come to me. That would be wrong. But it's purely holy in the mind and the heart of God. Everything that God does is motivated by his passion for his own glory. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, where Paul outlines the, the, the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. He talks about the, how the Father elects and, and predestined those who would be saved. It's to the praise of his, what? Glory. And then he goes on to talk about how the Son is the one who redeems through his blood and he forgives those who have trespassed and it's all for the praise of his glory. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit and the sealing work that the Spirit accomplishes in the lives of believers. And it's all to the praise of his glory. Three times in describing God's plan of salvation, Paul reminds us it's all to the praise of his glory. And so if we want to be pleasing to God then everything we do must also be motivated by a passion for his glory. It should be all to the praise of his glory. I love the, the simple little line in 3 John 7, which could be easily overlooked, but this is a, a section about um, John was, the apostle John was instructing those he was writing to about how to care for missionaries traveling evangelists, those who were out proclaiming the gospel. And it says this, very simple, 3 John 7. For they went out for the sake of the name. They went out for the sake of the name. Capital N, by the way, the name of Jesus. Again, what a great reminder that we should not be striving to make a name for ourselves but to see God make a great name for himself. And instead of being consumed with our little kingdoms, we need to get caught up in his kingdom. And when that happens, then the spread of his glory will become the most important thing in our lives, far more important than our petty pleasures and possessions and pursuits and plans and, and problems. John Piper says it this way, he said, quote, God is pursuing with omnipotent passion the worldwide purpose of gathering joyful worshipers for himself from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Therefore, he says, let us bring our affections in line with his and for the sake of his name, let us renounce the quest for worldly comforts and join his global purpose. And one of the things I enjoyed the most when I first read this book was all the examples of great missionaries of the past and present that Piper includes uh, in this to inspire us. But, 
But when you look at the lives of all the great missionaries, uh, dead and alive, it, it is a zeal for God's glory that drives them or that drove them. They, they were motivated to, to sacrifice everything, not so much out of obedience to God or compassion for the lost, which of course was part of that, I'm sure, but mostly it was because of the awesomeness of God's glory. Some of you know I'm a fan of David Brainerd. He was a missionary to the American Indians in the New England states and coming from New England. Um, I heard about him growing up. I didn't really know much about him. Of course, I wasn't um, really on fire for the Lord in my younger years when I was there uh, growing up and, and um, diving into church history was not on my list of priorities, let's put it that way. Um, but I remember when I was in seminary, I was in the library and I stumbled across this little book called The Life and Diary of David Brainerd. Now that sounds interesting and I hesitated to check it out because, you know, in seminary, the problem with seminary is you, you only have time to read the books they make you read. You can't just you know, pleasure read and things you really want to read, right? So anyway, I pulled it off the shelf. I checked it out, brought it home, and I put it by uh, on my nightstand. And so uh, for several months, Kel and I would lay awake in bed and we would read this, just a few entries a night before we turn the light on. And it was so moving and inspiring and convicting. We're like, who is this guy? Who was this guy? This is what he wrote, one of his entries. This is just, by the way, his journal, right? Some of you keep journals. This is what he wrote in his journal. I exceedingly long that God would get to himself a name among the heathen. And I appealed to him with greatest freedom that he knew I preferred him above my chief joy. Indeed, I had no notion of joy from this world. I cared not where or how I lived or what hardships I went through so that I could but gain souls for Christ. And what you need to know about David Brainerd, apparently he was a gifted guy. Uh, he was offered a, a, a pastor job, pastor position, on a very uh, prestigious, affluent church on Long Island in New York. And he could have had a very influential ministry there, uh, probably lived a very comfortable life there, but he turned it down. Why? Because he wanted to go traipse through the woods and find these Indians who had never heard about Jesus. And so he ended up living out in these little shacks and climbing the corn cribs to find some warmth in the middle of the winter. It says that he would go out in the, in the middle of the, 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 the snow uh, in the woods and get down on his knees and pray. And he was so fervent in prayer that he would come back into his little hut sweating. That's how fervent he was in prayer. Um, an impassioned soul. In fact, uh, he really, from my perspective, worked himself to death. Didn't take good care of his body. Uh, just put his body through all sorts of stress and, and, and uh, trauma. And he died of tuberculosis at the age of 29. And in fact, he was in the home of Jonathan Edwards, who um, had given his daughter hand in marriage, they were to be married. I guess he was engaged to Jonathan Edwards' daughter, David Brainerd. And, and, and Jonathan Edwards was so impressed by this young man. On his deathbed, he, he asked him permission to print or publish his, his, his diary, which, of course, David Brainerd didn't want him to do that, but Jonathan Edwards did it anyway because he thought that the world needed to know this guy, David Brainerd, and learn from him. But this was his final entry on his deathbed. Oh, that his kingdom might come in the world, that they might all love and glorify him for what he is in himself, and that the blessed Redeemer might see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. That was his dying prayer. Oh, that that would be our heart, 
to be anything, to do anything, to go anywhere, to endure whatever, so that God would be glorified and God would be satisfied. So the main motivation for missions is simply a zeal for God's glory. A passion to see everyone in the world come to know and honor and glorify God. And so our passion to tell others about God is really fueled by our own worship of God. Being a witness for Christ is simply the result of being a worshiper of Christ. And if you truly prize Christ, you will naturally proclaim Christ. I first heard the profound principle from Piper that people praise what they prize. People praise what they prize. You do it, I do it, we all do it. We're all wired to worship. And so it's very normal, it's very natural for us to tell other people about something that we love, something that we enjoy. You go to a, a, a new restaurant, and you have an amazing meal, and you, what do you do? You, you go and tell your friends, hey, you got to try this new restaurant, man, it is amazing. Or, or you go see a movie, right, a really good movie, you're like, wow, that was an amazing movie. And what do you do? You go tell people, like, oh, man, you got to go see this movie, it was amazing. Or maybe a new song comes out, you listen to the song, and you're like, oh, man, so what do you start doing? You start sharing that song. Well, you got to listen to the song, it's amazing. We, we, whatever we prize most is what we talk about the most. And the more we talk about it, the more we, we show its value and, and worth to us. And, and it is, it's interesting. Have you noticed that when we really love something, you try to get others, we try to get others to praise it with us. We say things like, man, wasn't that, wasn't that great? You go to a concert, man, wasn't that great? Or, isn't, isn't that beautiful? You, you see a sun, man, isn't that, look at that mountain, isn't that amazing? Or, here, doesn't that taste good? Right, the new bluebell flavor comes out, you're like, oh, dude, have you tried the new bluebell flavor? It's amazing, you gotta try that. It's awesome, that's just the way we're wired. When we truly love something or, or someone, we can't help but want to tell others about it. There's no sense of obligation. Well, I have to talk about it. No, there's this overwhelming sense of jubilation. You can't help yourself. And the problem is not getting up the courage to tell people because it's right. My pastor said, I gotta tell you about Jesus, so I'm telling you about Jesus. No, the problem is coming up with the words to express your delight in Christ. And so based on the fact that we praise what we prize, the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is what do we prize most in life? Is Christ the pearl of great price which you've gladly sold everything, sacrificed any, everything to gain? Do you consider everything in your life trash, rubbish? The Greek word skubalon actually means poop compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus? If you do, then guess what? You've got something to talk about. Because what you prize provides infinitely greater happiness and satisfaction than anything that this world has to offer. Nothing anyone can buy, achieve, accomplish, experience, drink, sniff, do, you name it, it will never compare with the joy and pleasure that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. I know I've shown this to you before, but every time I watch it, it convicts me, it compels me, so I'm gonna make you watch it again. I don't wanna be the only one convicted. Um, this is Matt Papa, a song he wrote called The Reward of of his suffering. Matt Papa is a modern day Keith Green, in my opinion. 
He's even got the hair to go with it. And uh, he just loves Jesus, and he, he has a passion for, for the lost. But more than anything, he has a passion for God's glory. And uh, he wrote this song, and he'll tell his own version of that story of those two Moravian missionaries as it begins. But then just listen to the lyrics, and don't miss it. Wait for it at the end. There's some very compelling questions that will come across the screen that I challenge you uh, to answer in your own heart as you watch this. Okay. It was the early 1700s when John Leonard Dobear and David Nitchman first heard about the island. They were at church on an ordinary Sunday morning and the pastor was speaking about a place in the West Indies where there had never been any gospel witness. He told of a man who lived on an island who was an atheist slave owner with about 3,000 slaves, all of whom would live and die there without a chance to ever hear of Jesus. Deeply disturbed by what they heard, these two men in their early 20s made the decision to go to this place to reach these slaves with the gospel. Their plan? Sell themselves into slavery so that they could be among these men. Sell themselves into slavery. It, these guys, they weren't heading on a short-term mission trip. These men left to go and live and suffer as slaves. And they had no idea if they would ever come back. Their families and friends, in large part, were all against their decision. And yet, John and David prepared to go. And so the story goes, these two young men arrived at the pier to board the ship. Their families and friends all there to say goodbye. And they were sure they would never see them again. The men boarded the ship and set out. And as the gap between the shore and the ship widened, the two men linked arms and one of them raised his hand and shouted across the gap these final words. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering.
pressure the bride you love We know though we suffer you have won And so we're running to this world Fearing nothing but your Let's pray. Father, it's been uh, an honor and a privilege to honor and praise you and glorify you today in this place. But Lord, we're not content with being able to do this simply within the four walls of this building. Lord, we desire that the nations, Lord, would praise you and honor you and glorify you and give you the the, the, the praise and honor and glory that, that you're due. And so, Lord, thank you for uh, the privilege that we have to go out these next couple of weeks as a church, even though just a handful of people from our church are going, we go as representatives of this entire body. I pray that we would all sense that and, and feel like we're all part of this and we would pray and we would give and we would um, support in any way we can. And Lord, as we think about people, these people groups that were just flashed before us on the screen, uh, all with great needs, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't look past our neighbors, look past the people at our work, in our workplaces, at, at our schools, Lord, that desperately need to know about Christ and need to hear what Christ did for them on the cross, and so just pray that we would be faithful to um, focus on the gospel both here and abroad, that we'd never forget about our own local community because we're so focused on world missions. Um, help us to, be, to shine brightly here as well. So we ask your blessing upon uh, these trips and ask that you would be uh, glorified in all of it. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.